Hello and welcome. This is a history of medieval philosophy. I'm Mark Dorsby and today we'll be discussing St. Augustine's dialogue, The Teacher. So welcome back everyone. I hope you're doing well. Just as a quick reminder, this is, uh, in our last video, I gave just a brief overview of what some of the major figures within medieval philosophy are that we'll be covering throughout this video series. Well, today we're going to sort of begin in earnest by taking a look at one of the mammoth thinkers of the medieval period, uh, particularly the early period, is St. Augustine, and, or Augustine of Hippo. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, before we get going to that, a little bit about e early medieval Christian philosophy and the role and the tension that existed between philosophy and the early Christian church. And it's important here to remember historically that Christianity actually began as a small minority community in the pagan world. Um, and so, and, and there was a philosophical dimension of the early church. We see this in the philosophical terminology that's used by um, St. Paul in the Pauline writings. We also notice that in the Gospel of John in particular, we see that there is, a, there is use of a notion of logos. Now, logos um, in Greek means, means word or means talk, it means discourse. And we read in the first uh, verse, in the first chapter of the book of John, which is one of the four Gospels that tells the story of Jesus Christ. And if you're unfamiliar with Christianity here, um, there's lots online you can learn about. Um, but uh, Christ, uh, Jesus Christ is the very center of the Christian religion. And Jesus is considered to be an incarnation of God. And Jesus had to sacrifice himself. Um, in order to allow salvation for people. Um, now, the very first, and there's four main Gospels, uh, four primary Gospels that are considered canonical, and that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each of them are biographical insofar as they tell the story of who Jesus Christ was. Um, the, but there's philosophical language, particularly in the fourth Gospel, the book of the Gospel of John. The very first verse, for instance, says that in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Now, interestingly enough, this book was actually written in the city of Ephesus. Um, Ephesus was actually where Heraclitus was from, and Heraclitus is an early pre-Socratic philosopher who heavily emphasized the notion of Logos. Today, we might think that Logos here can refer to reason. For Heraclitus, the idea was that the Logos is a central unifying principle for all of nature and all of reality, and ultimately, this is, it's through this principle that our knowledge of the world can originate or comes into being. So Logos is really central. And we see in this first book of John that the early gospel writers had already begun to recognize or import philosophical concepts or to some degree into their own language. So we can say that the early medieval church, or I'm sorry, not the early medieval, but the early church did have a philosophical, did have some philosophical underpinnings, but to be frank, in the first two centuries of the Christian church, there really is, there's no systematic treatment, or at least there's none existing, um, that tries to take into account how the, how the teachings of the Christian religion are ultimately, um, can be explained through rational argumentation or through theological speculation. So what we see here is that Christianity appears to manifest Greek philosophical ideas, but that the relationship between Christianity and Greek philosophy is also a source of hermeneutical conflict. In fact, what we'll see is that, and we'll see this throughout our entire period, is that some people were hostile to the notion of philosophy and a philosophical evaluation of religious belief, while others in the early Christian church were in support of it. And this, to this day, this is still an element of tension within the various sects of the Christian religion. But I do want to pull this quote from Adolf Harnack, who said, quote, that the most important event that ever happened in the history of the Christian doctrines took place at the beginning of the second century on the day when Christian apologists laid down the equation that Logos is Jesus Christ. And so there's sort of emphasis to what we're talking about there. And so that means that really after 200 AD, that is, in the second, after the second century, what we see is that thinkers begin to philosophize increasingly systematically about their faith. Now, there's, as I mentioned, there's sort of two camps that emerge. 
and really still exists today. This is the pro-philosophical camp, which in the early Christian period here would, was represented by Justin Martyr. And then the second is the anti-philosophical camp, who's actually represented by Justin's um, uh, student, Tatian, uh, who argued against philosophy to a certain degree. Now, there's many key thinkers of this early period, but some of them that you may want to research and learn more about that we're not going to discuss in this video, but who are important to the development of early Christian philosophy leading up to uh, uh, Augustine here is Anathagoras, Hippolytes, um, Ereas, uh, Minucius Felix, Honorbius, um, Lactantius, and Tertullian. Um, Tertullian is probably considered the most important of these, and he's famous for saying that having this great question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? In other words, if Jesus comes from Jerusalem and Greek philosophy comes from Athens, then what is the relationship between philosophy and the Christian faith? What exactly does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? And this is the sort of question that, in fact, will get repeated again and again throughout the medieval period. Now, some of the early thinkers from this, after this early period are the people we would refer to as the Alexandrians because they lived in Alexandria, um, a city founded by Alexander the Great in Egypt. Now, two of these major thinkers we would mention is Clement of Alexandria, who lived from around 150 to 215 AD. And his argument was that the Greeks showed that there was a need for God among men and that the Logos is commanded to all and is therefore in both religion and philosophy. So Clement sought to show that even though Greek philosophy was distinct from the Christian religion, that ultimately the two are harmonious because the Logos, um, the, the Logos is present throughout all of nature. Um, and then on the other hand, the Greek philosophers demonstrated that there had to be a further explanation for things and that there had to be some sort of God. Um, in order to explain things, or some, some sort of unifying principle. Another one of these thinkers is Oregon, and he lived from 185 to around 254 uh, BC, uh, AD, and he actually is one of the first, earliest thinkers to articulate the important distinction between the literal and the allegorical senses of interpreting Scripture. So, for instance, if, someone, if you look in the Bible, uh, you'll see that the Bible is composed of books, and that each book is composed of chapters, seems normal, and that each chapter is composed of verses. Um, but there's a question here, is there's many times where there's, for instance, stories in the Bible, and the question is, how should we interpret those? Are those literal, or are they simply allegories to teach us a deeper meaning? Now, Oregon, and we're not going to try to answer that here, and not in this video, um, certainly not, but we can see that this distinction between the literal and the allegorical is extremely important to contemporary uh, hermeneutics, to the contemporary hermeneutics of the Bible. Or, and of course, it's not just the Bible here, this distinction applies equally really to all texts. Um, by the early fourth century, a major event occurs which really changes everything, and that's that Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so this meant that at this point, the political structure of the church began to develop. And with that political structure, we see the rise of, if you will, an institutionalization of the church, which, will, which would eventually allow for a more systematic evaluation, philosophical evaluation of church teachings. Now, some of these early 4th century theologians include Eusebius, Gregory of Nazianz, uh, Basil the Great, um, uh, Nemesius, and also Gregory of Nyssa. Now, Gregory of Nyssa is also one of the more important figures of this period because he was really the first to present rational arguments for all of the teachings of the church. And he actually sought to uh, have explanations for what today are considered the mysteries of the faith, which include the idea that God is man, or the idea that, uh, that you could have a virgin birth, um, and so on and so forth. And, but Gregory sought to systematically evaluate these. And noteworthy, it's noteworthy here, that he utilized a form of Platonic philosophy in order to articulate these. So, it, so the very first major systematic attempt to submit church teachings to a rational system was done so by using Plato's philosophy. And we'll see Augustine actually is going to do something similar. Uh, we won't see it too much in today's discussion of the teacher, but we will see it later. 
Pardon me. Another important figure here, we mentioned in our last video here, is Pseudo Dionysius. And we say pseudo here because the text that we have for this thinker, we know are not authentic text. Um, they, we do believe that Dionysius existed, so there's a question here of their relationship. But with Dionysius, and we will read this later, we see that there's a threefold division in terms of the epistemological theology of God. We can either know God in a positive sense, we can know God in a negative sense, we can know what God is not. And we can also can know God in a superlative sense, uh, a praiseworthy sense, maybe. Um, so, there, so we see with uh, pseudo Dionysius here a further distinction in evaluation of the epistemological conditions um, for doing theology. Now, epistemology here refers to your theory of knowledge. So when I say when I say something like the epistemological conditions for knowing God, uh, what I mean there is what were the conditions which would, had to be met in order to say that certain types of knowledge can be gained about God. So, for instance, if I say God is immortal, then that is actually a positive characteristic of God. But how can I gain that knowledge? Probably through negation. Um, so, it's sort of, we see with uh, Pseudo Dionysius this first sort of further articulation into the evaluation of God. We see this doctrine or this teaching be, that comes through Dionysius in which God creates the world through illumination. And the idea here is that God makes these prototypes or divine ideas, but that with volitions and predestinations, that God ultimately articulates a created structural order to the world. Uh, and so you see that with that pseudo Dionysius is not only do you have an evaluation of God, but you also have a larger discussion of, of uh, the relationship between faith and philosophy in terms of for instance, cosmology and metaphysics. And so it's not just about, uh, when we talk about the philosophers in the Christian world, we're not just talking about people who just and only submitted um, their theology to a rational uh, interrogation, but also to people who are concerned, um, not only with theology, but with classic philosophical problems. So there's the both are going on. Now I should say is that um, there's other thinkers here, we could talk actually for a long time on this. We have a whole video on this. But let's just say here is that really after the 6th century, the Dark Ages occur, in which the learning and education of the Latin world essentially dries up. And then consequently, we see that Christian philosophy tends to go dormant uh, until around 800 AD, when Charles the Great is proclaimed head uh, and the Charlemagne Empire begins. So it's sort of interesting, really from 600 to 800, really lights go out, and we don't see a lot of new original work. Um, so, let's go back here at these early Christian thinkers before this, the Dark Ages here. Who's the most important of them all? And that's the Saint Augustine of Hippo. I love this painting of Augustine. Um, and here's a sort of straight on shot of what he may have looked like. Uh, he lived from 354 to 430 BC, right at the end of the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, so, it's interesting. He's not, it's probably not proper to say that he's a medieval philosopher. Uh, but without him, there would have not been any medieval philosophy. He's either the first medieval philosophy or the last classical philosopher. Uh, but since he's Christian, we usually just tie him in with the medievals. Now, he's considered really to be the most important of the early church fathers. And his teachings dominated Christian philosophy until the rise of Aristotelianism in the late 12th century. And this is where we're going to see St. Augustine is essentially the thinker who's linked with Plato. And then... Then when we get to the 12th century, we see that St. Thomas Aquinas it becomes the thinker who's linked with Aristotle, at least within the, the arc of Christian philosophy. Um, so, and again, you may want to go back and review or do a little bit of research and reading on the difference between Plato and Aristotle because it's extremely helpful. Um, you won't really need that to understand what uh, Augustine is writing about in The Teacher, but it is helpful to understand what Augustine's overall perspective is. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit here before we start getting into the actual dialogue. Because Augustine was known as an early, or he was known as a Neoplatonist, or a new Platoist, right? Um, so essentially, he would Christianize Plato's philosophy and using that sort of Christian, Christian Christianization would essentially be able to articulate a whole spectrum of teachings uh, for the ancient church. Or, yeah, the nature church. Now, here we should mention something a little bit about epistemology. 
I mentioned again that epistemology refers to a theory of knowledge for how things are known. Um, Augustine was well aware that there are many skeptical problems related to our perception. So for instance, I'm sitting here recording this video. I have a cup of water here, um, but how do I know that this cup is really in my hand? And here, for instance, you can immediately think of what some of the classic philosophical the objections to our knowledge about cups might be, right? I could say that I, I, I'm i experiencing the cup, but the experience is actually just an idea I have in my head. So how could I ever know that my idea actually matches the, the, the cup? So in other words, just because I have a perception that there's a cup, how does that, under what conditions could I say that that perception really is a representation of an actual cup? It's a difficult philosophical question, and it's one that Augustine was well aware of. And he does have this basic epistemology here, which is that he thinks that our knowledge, sure, our knowledge begins perhaps with our perceptions, where our perceptions are sensations, but our perceptions are not just sensations. They are actually rather sensations combined with rational judgment. So in other words, you get sort of this formula in Augustine's work here, which is to say that when we talk about perception, perception is really a combination between our senses and our reason. Um, and this is important because ultimately, as a Neoplatonist, it, Plato was a dualist, right? And so he thought that you had a body and you had a soul, but that ultimately your soul is what does the knowing, not the body. And in that same sense, Augustine follows along. He, so he says, yeah, we have perception, but remember, our perception is actually reveals an element regarding the activity of the soul. Now, an object, for instance, can be... Now, another thing here about epistemology is, okay, when we see an object that's beautiful, uh, we see A, in one sense, we just see the object, right? You can just see it. But on the other hand, not only do we have a sense of the object, but in recognizing an object as being beautiful, we also somehow make a judgment that, that references some other external absolute standard for what counts as beautiful. So for instance, when I see this beautiful sunset, uh, and, or if you've ever been on the beach, you've seen the sun setting, right? You, hopefully you're struck by the beauty that's before you. And it's, it's awe-inspiring, right? It's, it's, it's a sort of amazing, awesome sight. Uh, but how is it that you're able to recognize that it's beautiful? Obviously you have sensations, but if I'm looking at a garbage dump, I also have sensations, right? The idea is that I make a judgment with my mind, but where does that judgment occur from? Well, I must have some external standard of what beautiful is by which I can judge and calibrate how beautiful this is as opposed to this. So for instance, this sunset may not be as beautiful as one that you've seen, but the reason you can make that judgment, according to Augustine, is because you're referencing some sort of external standard. And so I have a sort of picture here of the French meter. Here's a meter, or right here, down here. Here's a meter, so you can always see you know, how long a meter is, but essentially you have to have some standard to judge things by, and that's Augustine's basic insight here. And of course, what is that standard? It's ultimately going to be this platonic ideal that rests with God. So, and here's another way in which, so what we see in the general but uh, Augustonian or Augustinian uh, perspective here is a Platonic idea. And that's namely that the soul is the seat of our identity, our reason and our sensation, not the body. Which means that knowledge is gained by looking inwardly, not by looking outwardly. So if we're going to put Augustine in any sort of category, we could say that Augustine is essentially a rationalist. Because he thinks that ultimately knowledge is gained through the introspection of reason, that God illuminates to us through our conceptual exploration and so forth. But strictly speaking, epistemologically, it's not the body that does the work, it's the mind. Now, so therefore that means that knowledge, to have knowledge at all, means to have knowledge of immutable ideas or to have knowledge of forms. And when we read the city of God here in a couple weeks, you're going to see that come through in much stronger terms and much more explicitly. But I think it's important here in our introductory video of Augustine to talk about this. We'll also see that the search of truth for Augustine finds its goal in God, because God is truth. So that means that ultimately, if, if philosophy is ultimately seeking truth, then that means that philosophy must also be seeking God. You can see just in the way I phrase that, I have reanimated the classic synthesis medieval synthesis between philosophy and theology.
Uh, now, another major problem of Augustine's that he's interested in articulating and worried about is what we call the problem of evil. The argument is simple. If God is all-knowing and all-good, and God created all things, and God is incapable of doing evil, then why is there evil in the world? Because after all, the world has been created by God, apparently. But if that's the case, and I certainly do seem to see evil in the world, then is God really God? Is God powerful enough to not create an evil world? Is God unable to? Or is God actually evil himself and actually chooses to create an evil world? And so this problem of evil actually motivated St. Augustine throughout his entire life, both before he was a Christian as well as after. Um, and he has a very interesting discussion, which, which, which we'll come to. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I want this to sort of put this on your radar screen as we're reading this. And of course, the two, uh, the main work that we're going to look at in a couple of videos here is the City of God, in which Augustine really articulates a dualism here. Uh, the dualism between God and the dualism between man. Now, in terms of his biography, I, I mean, there, you should read a biography on Augustine if you really want to learn more about Augustine in detail. But he was born in Tagaste of Numidia, which is modern-day Tunisia, on November 13, 354. His mother was a Christian, but his father was not, uh, though his father would eventually convert to Christianity. He actually studied rhetoric in Carthage, uh, so he was trained in rhetoric, so he was trained in articulating and making arguments. Um, now, while he was in Carthage, he actually gave up Christianity and became a Manichaean. Now, Manichaeanism was a religion that held that there's two central principles, a light principle and a dark principle, an evil and a good. Um, and it came from the prophet of Mani, hence the term Manichaeanism. And he actually became uh, you know, an important figure and apologist for Manichaeanism. While, while he was living in Carthage at this time, he also had a mistress and a son who was, who was Adidiatus. Um, in Car and this all happened in Carthage, but Adidiatus is actually the main character besides Augustine in the dialogue we'll be looking at today in the teacher. Now, eventually Augustine gave up his Manichaeanism and he moved to Rome and then eventually to Milan. Um, and then eventually he would go to Hippo. So he traveled quite a bit. But during this period, he became influenced by the new academy, that is, by the Neoplatonists. And it, it, while there, he actually had a conversion experience and became a Christian again. And he also studied importantly under and was baptized by Ambrose, who was a very, very important thinker from this early, from the late Roman period, an important Christian thinker. Um, Augustine would eventually go to become a pastor, and then through the church, he would eventually become the Bishop of Hippo where he would actually, he ran a, he ran a church um, in, in the city. So he actually uh, would eventually, he was born in Africa, and he would eventually move back to Africa. Now, he was an extremely prolific writer. Um, he actually started writing really in earnest around 385, and he wrote many, many works. Here's just a quick laundry list of some of them. Right, He wrote Against the Academics, On the Happy Life, On the Immortality of the Soul, The Soliloquies, the teacher, he wrote on music, Christian doctrines, but the key text of his is really the Confessions of the City of God. Uh, but he wrote many, many works, and this is just the major ones. Uh, many others still survive. Uh, so if you're interested in Augustine, there's lots to read about. Now, what I want to do before I sort of get into some of the nitty-gritty details of uh, Augustine's text, the uh, teacher, I want to talk a little bit just about today's topic, and also give you a quick summary of what Augustine's essentially going to be arguing. Now, one of the first major questions that we need to think about here is how is knowledge acquired? How do we actually gain knowledge? And it's pretty clear that knowledge, not all knowledge, but much of our knowledge actually comes through language. Now, that's not a fully, that's not a full and a sufficient answer to the question of how we gain knowledge, but that's one important piece is that we gain it through language. So then how is it possible that language can convey uh, knowledge about the world exactly? Because after all, language isn't exactly real. What do I mean by that? Well, language, um, the words I'm saying are actually just sounds. So consider it right now. If you're watching this video, then you're hearing sounds. I'm making these, these sounds with my tongue, and there's air. I mean, it's sort of disgusting when you think about it. 
my lungs are squeezing air through this little uh, little pipe in my neck and the way in which my tongue moves and the way in which my muscles constrict and the mucus and all that stuff goes about these sounds project these sound waves project out but somehow those sound waves when they hit your ear they actually convey knowledge about the world right so if I tell you that I'm holding a cup right and that I am holding a cup you can see that my language told you something about the world but notice here how is it possible that these guttural sounds actually can convey meaning you know kids often will repeat repeat a word over and over and over until it begins to lose its meaning I'm sure you've done that if you haven't you can right just pick any word like cup and just say cup 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 the longer you say it eventually it's as if the meaning of the word just drains out and you're just left with these sounds that don't seem to have really any meaning so you can sort of ask this question if we're going to talk about epistemology and how knowledge is gained in the world then it's clear and language is an important element to that there's this sort of paradox these puzzles regarding the nature of language that we want to take a look at now how and you can see you can ask the question well how exactly do our words signify things now for Augustine we're going to see that for him to talk about a word is to talk about a sign a sign right but on the one hand points to a thing but on the other hand the sign has its own symbols or or what we could say is its sign so for instance if I say the word cat I've used a sign and the spell the symbol here is C-A-T, that's the sign. But the thing that the word cat refers to, well, is actually this cute little fluffy kitten right here. Right? So you can see here that the words refer to things. So this important distinction you're we're gonna come back to. The thing is the res, and the sign is called the signum for um, Augustine. And importantly, notice here that in order for us to make sense of what a sign is. This requires understanding by someone, right? So that's the first thing, and is just breaking down the two basic components of language. Now, are there different types of signs? Now, we don't see Augustine talk about this too much in this dialogue, at least not in the excerpts that we're providing with you today uh, for our reading. But we can say is that on the one hand, there are natural signs, and a natural sign are naturalia, is a sign that signifies automatically. So for instance, if you see smoke in a room, then you will naturally think that there's something that's causing that smoke. So where there's smoke, there's fire. So here you can say is that for some signs, the meaning is as it were inherent to the sign itself. But that's not most of the signs we're really talking about. The signs where the puzzle comes into play here are what we call given signs, or you might say signs of convention. In Latin, uh, Augustine used the term signa data. And this is the notion that um, these signs are arbitrary, right? That we, an intelligence, human intelligence, provides the meaning to the sign, um, right? So I have here the letters of the alphabet for English and Greek. And you can see here that they're all arbitrary squiggles of paper on a piece of paper, but that they have meaning. The meaning is simply given through the agreement that we have with each other. But what's important here is that when we talk about these signs, signs like words, right, then the meaning is not actually inherent to the sign itself. So then how does language communicate exactly? Because we can notice on the one hand that in communication there has to be a mind-to-mind -mind relationship. Somehow language conveys meaning. And on the other hand, there was also systems of convention between people in which there's a, there must be an agreement among these minds regarding how these symbols are to be understood. So you can see here is that it, perhaps what you didn't expect is that Augustine, just in terms of our general sort of uh, overlook here, he actually has provided systematic sort of evaluation. Now, some of the things that we're going to see here is that for Augustine, a sign causes us to think of something uh, that's made that um, something being the impression made, right? Something made the impression on us. So it's not cause us to think about, about not the sensation we're having, though we might think of that, but it causes us to think about the object of, this, of the sensation. And here, there's a great essay by Andrew Louth. I think it's from 1989, I think, 
um, called Augustine on Language, which really lays this out quite nicely. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, we're also going to see that words do more than simply prompt one to learn. And that it's an activity of the one who teaches within that enables science to have their meaning for learning. So we're going to see that Augustine is going to have this idea that ultimately within us we have a logos, and that that logos is really it's the divine intellect, it's God, and that God is teaching us, without the use of signs, how to understand what the signs are. So there's this sudden recognition we'll see in Augustine that obviously signs enable us to learn, but that the signs themselves, we'll put it this way, signs allow us to learn, but it's not the signs themselves that do the learning. Uh, something else is required. So in other words, learning requires something prior to language. Okay, so this sort of brings us finally to the teacher, uh, which is Augustine's dialogue on the teacher. And it's a dialogue between Augustine and his son, Adiadatus. And I, by the way, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but it is what it is. Um, but I also love, let me take a drink here. One of the things I really like about, about this dialogue is it's on the question of what te on language, but in the context of how we gain knowledge. And so it's called the teacher, but it's also between a father and a son, and in a father, not a father is the person who's supposed to teach their son. So there's this interesting dynamic going between these two in the dialogue, and we'll also see that even though Augustine clearly is the stronger thinker in the dialogue, that his son, that he's also extremely charitable to his son, uh, and so it's a really, I think the dialogue is a, a sort of beautiful example of how philosophy should be conducted. Though I think that I think that for those of you who read this this text, you will probably find that there are times when uh, sort of kind of the technical um, and the sophisticated way in which uh, he approaches the subject can become very complex, um, and it's very easy to lose track of yourself within the dialogue or lose track of what what he's arguing. But it's also important to know that Augustine even says that, and I actually have a quote here later. I'll show you. It sort of gets to the heart of it. So let's sort of start here. What's the purpose of language, right? What exactly is the goal when someone speaks a language? Now, this is important. So we're asking, what is the goal of speech? Now, to begin with, Adiantus, Adi, um, Adiodatus, he argues that, well, on the one hand, we speak in order to teach others. But on the other hand, we speak in order to learn. So this is how, te this is how the question of speech and teaching gets sort of all related together with this very first question of Augustine's. Now it's interesting because Augustine immediately criticizes this view and says, okay, I agree with you when it comes to teaching, but we're talking about learning, it seems kind of weird. How is it that we learn something by just saying words? And of course, Adiodatus says, well, we use questions, right? And it's interesting because Augustine's ultimately going to say, no, I, he doesn't think that that's actually about learning. He thinks that when we ask questions, we're actually teaching others what we don't know. So for Augustine, to begin with, language is always the whole function and purpose, uh, the purposive nature, if you will, of language is teach, it's pedagogy. This is very, very interesting. Now, there's other questions, is that really right though? Because you can sort of ask here, well, what about uh, when someone's singing? They're singing to themselves. Or, right, and I have this example here. I forgot this guy's name. Whoops. Uh-oh. That wasn't what I meant to do. Um, Jay, I think his name is James Corbin. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Right here, this guy right here. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, but he, he's famous for, there's Justin Bieber, and he's a comedian in there going on their drive and sing along. Uh, and so the question is, when people are singing, and when you're singing in your car to yourself, you can ask yourself, right, if Augustine's right, then I'm teaching somehow. What does that mean? And Augustine sort of gives a hint. He thinks that the type of teaching is that we're teaching ourselves to remember something. So, but he doesn't really go through it fully. So, um, at least not in the excerpts we'll be looking at today. So, here's the opening thesis, right, is that speaking is teaching. And that singing is actually a kind of reminding. It's a kind of memory um, process. We can remember things. Um, but his son says, but that's not why I sing. I sing because it pleases me. I like the way it sounds. 
And here, Augustine says, okay, what you're talking about is the melody of the songs. And so in that regard, singing really is distinct from speaking in this sense, right? We read this quote, anyone who asks gives an external sign of his will by means of an articulated sound. Yet God is supposed to be sought and entreated in the hidden parts of the rational soul, which is called the inner man, for he wanted those parts to be his temples. Now, there's a verse in the Bible that Augustine immediately quotes where Jesus says the body is the temple, uh, that our hearts are the temple, right? That God doesn't have to exist in a physical temple building, but that he exists within the inner soul of a person, right? That's what Augustine's saying here. Uh, so you can see here that uh, this will become important later because we're going to see ultimately there's this inner man ultimately that does the work of learning. It's not the language itself that conveys the, the meaning. It's always takes place in the inner man. Um, so, but he recognizes this sort of inner outer distinction, this problem that will come back again too, uh, which I think is quite interesting. Now we can, another question that's good raised here is where do you think the sacrifice of justice is offered? Up, but in the temple of the mind and in the bed chambers of the heart, right? So Augustine thinks here again that ultimately um, it's not just, it's the inner that has the preference, not the outer. So there's accordingly no need to speak when we pray, right, um, for Augustine. Why? Because, well, the words in our prayers are not for God, but they're for people. God doesn't need the words. It's people that need the words. Um, so, for instance, the qu a question gets raised here is, what about the Lord's Prayer? What about when Jesus um, teaches people how to pray, right? He says, of our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven, and so on and so forth. Right, that's the Lord's Prayer. And so a question gets raised here is, well, wait a second. If God does, if God's in the inner heart, and God doesn't need our words, and we don't need to use words while we pray, then why did God teach us to pray? Didn't he teach us to use those words? And Augustine says, no. Right? For Augustine, the idea is that, uh, is that he taught not the words, but the things themselves by means of the words. And so we have a very important distinction here, which is that the, me, the word that what Jesus teaches for Augustine is not the words that we have to say for a prayer, but he teaches the ideas that the words are talking about. So we see suddenly a very important philosophical distinction. This is the difference between the signs and the things in themselves. Uh, I feel like right there we should have some sound effects. Da, 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 right? Signs versus things in themselves. And you can see this goes back to an important discussion even in Plato's work on the role of signs and representation and things in and of themselves. So these questions are very old, but it is particularly a medieval approach here because we see that laced through all of it is a discussion um, about uh, the Christian religion and the way in which one, Augustine, one can cons consistently understand scripture um, given the philosophical insights that he articulates through argumentation. So we see sort of both things going on. So it's medieval, really, because it's just, put it this way, is that the, uh, the philosophy, the religions, really all intertwined and mixed up together. This raises the question about, okay, what is the nature of science? How can we understand how science work? Right? Can a sign be a sign if it has nothing to signify, for instance? Um, and so think about it. If words are signs um, and they point us in the direction of things, well, can a sign be a sign if it doesn't signify anything? So consider this sentence. Um, There's a sentence he actually gives his son to consider. Augustine says, If nothing from so great a city is, um, is it pleases the gods, be left. Right? This actually is the first part of a sentence, and there's 13 words in there. And Augustine begins, though he doesn't do it all the way through, he begins by say, sort of asking Adiodatus to explain each of these words, because if each of these are words, and they clearly are, then that means each of these are signs. But if each of these are signs, and signs have to refer to something, well, what do these things refer to? So the first is if. So the word if, what does that refer to? In Adiodatus's reply is it refers to some sort of doubt, right, a hypothetical uh, or a conjecture of some type. And Augustine isn't totally pleased with that answer, but he accepts it and says, okay, let's keep going. And then Adiodatus says, well, and then the question is, well, what does the word nothing refer to? 
And the answer is, well, it must refer to that which doesn't exist. But wait a second. If the word refers to is a sign, and the sign doesn't, and the signs have to refer to something, and nothing refers to that which is, which is no thing, right? There is no somethingness when it comes to nothingness. Then that means that we have a case all of a sudden in which words seem to refer to things that are that don't exist or things that are not signs. And so this raises a really sort of important question, and it's an old philosophical question, right? going all the way back to a pre-Socratic philosopher, Parmenides, right? It looks like either not all of our words are signs or not all of our signs actually signify, right? So we're not sure how to make sense of this nothing problem. Um, and we'll see, uh, we'll see how, uh, how Augusta refer responds. And what he says is that nothing must not refer to a thing, like a substance, something you can point to, but it must refer to a state of mind to a way of seeing, in, in fact. It's very, very interesting because if we leapt ahead into 20th century existentialist philosophy, Jean-Paul Sartre argues something similar, where he argues that negation, nothingness, is actually a function of consciousness, and it's an essential feature. And I don't want to get into all of that, but I want to emphasize and show you here that many of the contemporary insights of modern philosophers, they're actually recognized already by Augustine a long time ago. Okay, let's get back to that sentence. What about the word from? Well, from must mean out of, right? It comes out of something. But but here, uh, his son also recognizes that when we say that some, someone's from something, that also seems to signify that there's a separation between them and the place or the thing out of which they're derived or from where they're from, where they came out of, as it were. And this sort of raises a really sort of interesting question, which is, well, what if you have a person who, who's from somewhere, but that place was destroyed? So Troy is a good example. The city of Troy was destroyed. The Trojan civilization was wiped off the face of the earth. So what if there was a person who survived all of that, and you said, he's from Troy? So there you have a, a weird problem where, okay, in that case, you have, it looks like the object of the sign doesn't exist. But did we say earlier that a sign has to refer to something? So can it refer to a something that doesn't exist? Or does it have to be a something which does exist? So in other words, signs ha a sign ha can refer to the, an object that it signifies, a res, and then it uses a word like Troy or Rome, and that that object either exists or doesn't exist. So this is kind of a, a quick little sketch of the structure of the way in which Augustine's starting to break down what signs are. But there's a problem, which is namely that it looks like no matter what we do, words are, we're trying to explain words with still other words, right? So words are getting explained by means of words. Is that sufficient to actually explain anything, right? So imagine, for instance, if I was swimming and I wanted to explain how to, and you asked me to explain how to swim, and I responded by continuing to swim. Would that be sufficient? It doesn't look like it. Uh, or at least it doesn't make total sense. So the first sort of example is, okay, how exactly do words explain things? And so if we're to try to understand what a wall is, for instance, what would we do? Maybe we do it just point our finger at the wall, right? And this is known as, as, as an ostensible definition. And by the way, I want to quickly pause here and let you know that a very important philosopher, um, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein of the 20th century, actually discusses and attacks the idea of ostensible definitions um, in, in, uh, in a much later period. And in fact, the philosophical investigations that Wittgenstein writes quotes Augustine in the beginning. So, interesting. But we'll actually see in the dialogue here that Augustine also rejects ostensible definitions. Because he doesn't think that it's the pointing that makes the word meaningful. Rather, he's going to ultimately say it's the, in, it's the hidden logos within that does that. Now, what does that mean exactly? Anyway, we'll, we'll come to that throughout the chorus again and again. So, but this question first is, okay, if there's a wall, you can explain it by pointing to it and saying, the word wall is that thing right there, um, right? Or I could say, here's a phone. What's a phone? The, what does the word phone mean? It means that, right? So you can use ostensible definition. But the problem is, that doesn't really make a lot of sense ultimately because what about things that don't have bodies in space, not in the proper sense? For instance, what about color? If I say something's red, you can see here's a kid, um, here are two deaf children talking to each other. 
Um, and this child, he has a red shirt on. So if, I, if someone said, what does the word red mean? Maybe they don't speak English. And I just point at this kid. Will that be enough to explain what red is? It doesn't seem like it. It seems like just pointing doesn't may actually explain. So, in, of course, consider the use of signs for the deaf. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because Augustine specifically mentions the deaf. And he says, deaf people, they use a whole range of signs to articulate what they mean, and they do it well, and they don't need words. Um, so is that also a type of pointing? What does that mean exactly? What is the function of a sign? And it's a very interesting sort of question. So, uh, so it's here we suddenly see a, another question gets raised, which is Augustine, where, which I call the walk and walking, which is Augustine asks his son, he says, they, they actually disagree with each other because Augustine at this point, in the early point of the dialogue, thinks that signs can only point to other signs. And Adiodatus thinks that signs can only refer... I'm sorry, let me say that again. Augustine thinks that signs cannot only point to other signs, but that at the end of the day, they have to point to things themselves. Whereas Adiodatus thinks that, well, signs only refer still to other signs. Now, does that make sense? We're going to see that, of course, Augustine's position will, will prevail, but he does so in a very interesting way, right? He says, do all things require that there has to be a sign in order for those things to be shown or to be seen? So, for instance, if I asked you what walking means, you might stand up and start walking and point to it and as I eventually help me build a connection with that word, that sound, of the syllables and letters and noises, and somehow link it to the motion of walking. But then Augustine says, well, what if I ask what walking is while we're walking? <laughs> How are you going to explain that exactly? Because while we're walking, right, there's nothing you can point to because I'm already walking. So you, the only way you can explain it is by doing, some, doing something other than walking. But if you're doing something other than walking, how exactly is one supposed to connect the word walking with the activity of walking? Um, and so you can see here, there's a little bit of a conundrum here. And this eventually brings Augustine, as well as the Adiodatus, to the fundamental division of signs. So when a question is raised about certain signs, these signs can be exhibited by means of other signs. Um, right, so I can, if you ask me what the word epistemology means, I'll give you words in return. Um, and I'm using those words to help explain it. But number two is when a question is raised about things that are not signs, these things can be exhibited either by A, doing them after the query has been made, or by giving signs with which they may be brought to one's attention. So there's a different way in which our signs seem to emerge. Now, the, one of the first considerations here is what we might call signs by means of other signs. So, it, so there's two sorts of relations to be clear. On the one hand, we're going to see at first Augustine's looking at the question of, okay, you have signs that refer to other signs. And then you have... Um, other signs which refer to things. So for instance, imagine if I say the word word. Word refers to other things which are signs, right? Uh, whereas if I say the word stone, it refers to an object. So we see here is that words are not the only signs that we can have, right? I can use my, this is my hand here, just like I'm doing now. I can use my hand to signal things to you, right? So Words are just one type of signs, but not all signs are words. Now, if we're just going to talk about words, because language is composed of words, what we can say is that words designate either, either other sounds or they designate non-signs, like the stone, for, ins for instance. So, that may, so, the next point here is that names signify something, but what exactly do names signify? So, for instance... Uh, I'll, I'll use my phone as an example. So I have a phone, but I've named my phone. I actually typed it in so that way when I log on to my computer, I can see which phone it is as opposed to someone else's phone. The name of my phone is Jujukamo, right? So same name signifies something, but what exactly? It looks like names signify really just other signs, right? Things which can be signified but are not yet, we can call signifiable. So not everything has a sign, or not everything has a name, but if it could in principle receive one, it is called signifiable. And number five, written signs, in, in Augustine's view, are signs of other spoken signs. 
So in Augustus's view, and in the dialogue's view, is that ultimately there's a priority with the oral. Speech, before writing comes speech. Um, and, right, and so that's another important point. So written signs are just, so the word, C-A-T, is just something written for the speech utterance that I make. And the speech utterance is a sign of the cat that goes meow. Right, so written signs are signs of spoken signs, and spoken signs are signs of things in the world, or at least they could be. They're, they could be signs of other signs, and they could keep going too. Now, back to names. All of the names are words, but are all the words names? So, for instance, if a word, is there really a difference between what a name is and what a sign is? Because doesn't it just sign the name of something as a word? So what exactly is the difference between a word and a sign? And here we read this quote from Adiodatus, is that, or his suggestion, his initial suggestion, is that, well, the difference is, namely, the difference between the sign of a sign that signifies no other signs and the sign of a sign that turns, that in turn signifies other signs. So either eventually there's a sign it's referring to or there's not a sign it's referring to. Take, for instance, the word animal and take, break it up into three syllables to help remind yourself that it's merely just this phonetic guttural noise that we make. Animal. Animal. Now notice that when I say animal, the word does not signify animal, right? The word doesn't signify the sign itself, right? And there's a long discussion here about what names are, and eventually the conclusion here is that, well, okay, you have words which seem to be kind of like names, but names seem very particular. But you also have pronouns, too. So a pronoun is like saying he, she, or it, for instance. Those are all pronouns. But when I say, he, let's say, so the name of the phone is Jujukumo, right? The word, we might say, is phone. The name is Jujukumo. The pronoun is it, right? It stopped working, right? Um, now, here you notice that it looks like pronouns do something similar to names, except they're less exact, right? So the it here doesn't tell me much, but it helps me point in the direction of which thing is being signified. So it looks like there is still a similar consistent structure across the board between our words, our names, our pronouns, and there's other words. And in fact, Augustine goes through sort of systematically, almost painfully so, about some of the different you know, distinctions here between verbs and pronouns and basic grammatical distinctions and grammatical categories. But back to it, I don't want to get lost in that discussion because it's quite complex and it's easier to read than probably for me to explain to you. Is that what we see is that words, when we do talk about words, words consist of sounds and letters. But to use a word isn't to signify the sounds and the letters themselves, like we learned with that example of animal, but rather their respective objects, the respective things that they are, their res. So we can say is that to say that something has virtue, for example, is not the same thing as saying that the words and sounds virtue are in that thing. So if I say, so for instance, if I have a student, I say this student is a very honest student. I'm not saying that the words honest, that the sign is what's in this person, but rather that the, the honesty, the object, the character trait is what's there. So it's important to recognize here is that Augustine is always orient, orienting us away from away from the idea that signs just, just refer to still other signs. Ultimately, a sign is only meaningful if it points outside of itself. That it points to something that's extrinsic to itself. So, back to names. If a part of speech is called something, then it's named. And if it's named, surely it is named by a name. So, for Augustine, all of the words are actually names, and all of the names can be known as terms. So for Augustine, our words are names, and the names we have can also logically just be called terms, um, and that they all have the same fundamental structure. They have a structure that represents towards something external. Now, it doesn't have to be an object. It doesn't have to be a corporeal object or a visible object, although that is discussed quite heavily. So, for instance, we get read this uh, sort of quotation. Maybe, I, I love this. This is from Augustine. This is where Augustine is... For some of you watching this video and listening, taking this class, you may be thinking, oh my gosh, this is so tedious. Who cares? Who cares how language works? And guess what? Augustine recognizes that you're going to think that. He says, 
Maybe you think we're playing around, that we're diverting the mind from serious matters by some little puzzles that seem childish, or that we're pursuing some result that's only a small or modest, or if you suspect this distinction might issue in some important result, and you want to know straight away what it is, well, I'd like you to believe that I haven't set to work on mere trivialities in this conversation. My apologies for the little spelling errors there. <coughs> <coughs> So I, I wanted to include that to just to emphasize to you the way in which Augustine recognizes that you will see this as tedious. He knows it is, right? Now, let's move here. So that's about signs that refer to other signs, which ultimately can only make sense so long as they refer to something else. So that brings us to the second part, which is signs that refer to things, the res. So when a word is spoken, it refers to something. So he, Augustine gives the example of when someone says man. Now, in Latin, the word man is homo. So homo has two syllables, homo, right? So imagine if I'm talking about homo, then I'm talking about a person, which means that the person who hears the word thinks of the object, not the syllables, right? So if I say, if, imagine if they, um, a general said, we've got, we've got five men in the battle of theater, right? He doesn't mean that there's symbols or syllables that are in the battle of theater. He means it's actually the object that those syllables represent. That's the first thing to recognize here. And, and that the law of reason, he says, that's implanted in our minds is ultimately what guides our understanding of these signs. This is very important because and it's very Neoplatonic. Because he doesn't think, if it's, remember the signs are guttural. The signs are, are physical or material things, right? So if the sign, if we would look, if teaching is done, by signs, and signs only refer to other signs, then it doesn't make any sense. But someone has to understand what those signs mean. So that means that there has to be something internal to us to make sense of that signification uh, process. Um, and it's the law of reason. It's the logos, ultimately. right? Things signified also should be valued more than their signs. So the res has logical priority to the signum. In other words, that the object that something um, represents is more important and it's more valuable than the word itself that's doing the representing. So words exist really for uh, utilitarian reasons, right? They exist so that we can use them. So what is taught is what is valued, not the words that are used to teach. So this is important, right? Uh, going back to the notion of teaching, because in order for someone to learn, they don't just learn words but they learn the object of what the words are about. Um, and so teaching is what, and what the, it's the object, I put it, the lesson that we teach is what we value. It's not the words we use to teach those lessons, right? The meaning of a word is not intrinsic to itself. So that means the meaning is extrinsic, right? Now, Augustine reminds us of some, some key questions here. He says, remember, what's our goal here? We want to understand whether anything can be taught without signs, whether certain signs should be preferred to the things that they signify, whether the knowledge of things is itself better than the signs, and whether you think that these discover I'm sorry, whether you think of these discoveries in such a way that you can't have any doubts regarding them. So there's a whole range of epistemological questions that I'm gonna want you to be thinking about as we go through this and as you're reading this. <clears throat> so can someone teach without signs, right? And here we get the example of the bird catcher thought experiment. And I don't know a lot about bird catchers at all, uh, but Augustine describes a bird catcher. I mean, he says they have their tools and they have their techniques and they walk a certain way quietly to catch their birds and so forth. Um, and so what we can say is that if you wanted to learn what a bird catcher is, couldn't you just follow a bird catcher around, quietly just watching them and seeing what they do? And then eventually, at the end of the day, you would know what a bird catcher was. So the answer is, well, can something be taught without signs? Yeah. Why can't it be? Right? If I want to teach you how to pick up a fork, um, I could just pick up a fork and do it over and over until you're able to do the same thing. So it doesn't look like, um, it doesn't look like teaching always requires language. Though much of language does require that, require that. So notice that this is important because if a sign can be learned um, and without, a, I'm sorry, if something can be learned without a sign, 
and we discovered that signs should refer to things, then that means that there's something external to the use of signs that's responsible for learning. This is, gives evidence or credence to this notion that there must be within us a principle of reason that enables us to learn. Augustine writes, Therefore, a sign is learned when the thing is known, rather than the thing being learned when the sign is given. So, you just be hearing a word is not enough, right? You have to learn the objects of the word. The knowledge of words is ultimately made complete once things are known. So knowledge is very important. You have to have knowledge before you can actually have the understanding of the language. right? Because one does not learn from an external teacher, according to Augustine, but from, but from, the, in, from the inner teacher, the logos within. Right? He writes, quote, Regarding each of the things we understand, however, we don't consult a speaker who makes sounds outside us, but the truth that presides within over the mind itself, though perhaps words prompt us to consult him. What is more, he who is consulted, he who is said to dwell in the inner man, does teach. Christ, that is, the unchangeable power and the everlasting wisdom of God, which everything, uh, which every rational soul does consult, but is disclosed to anyone to the extent that he can apprehend it according to his good or his evil will. Now, there's a lot in that phrase, but I really want you to focus on there is the notion that there's an, there's, an in, there's an inner truth that we consult that enables us to gain knowledge. That is, one learns by consulting the inner truth by means of their reason. So go back all the way to Heraclitus and what we were discussing at the beginning of the video. You see that the notion of logos is absolutely central to, uh, to Augustine's account here. And ultimately, you see also here how a good demonstration of the way in which um, he's linking in Christ, Christianity, with Logos, Greek philosophy. So Augustine, we see that, that and we can say that Augustine is one of these synthesizers, right? He's synthesizing Platonic philosophy and Christian teachings in a way which is coherent, but in a way which, in a certain, which changes both, right? Augustine is, is, is not Plato. And in a certain way, Augustine is not just giving us what's in the scriptures either. We end up with a new third thing, a synthesis out of Augustine, I think. Right? Now, again, who is this inner teacher? Augustine says there is one in heaven who is the teacher of all. So the, so the, the reasons we have in our mind, that's not God. But those reasons in some way emanate from this God, or from God, uh, uh, or the one God. So teaching is a result of the student and their private oracle, right? And ultimately the idea here is that, remember in the ancient Greek philosophy, uh, in Greece they had the oracle of Delphi. And the oracle was a, a place, it was a temple, but there was a priestess who was the oracle and who would speak for the gods. And ultimately, since language um, works by means of signs, but those signs always require something external, then that means that Learning itself is not a process that is linguistic, but actually something that is primordial or, or is, comes a priori to language. So where, what is that? It's this logos. It's the reason. And the teaching of the student is actually the taught. The student is the one who teaches themselves. And so then you also have this sort of sense in which Augustine is linking up the great Socratic insight of Socrates, right, that... Um, Knowledge is something that is that is attained by the individual, right? And instead of Pl Plato's theory of recollection, we have a different theory, uh, but very similar, okay? And that, in general, is the basic gist of what the teacher is about. Now, there's a lot more in this dialogue that I haven't discussed, but this video is not meant to go through and give you the full commentary, the play-by-play -play of everything that Augustine discusses, but to give you an overall synopsis and in, in a sense for how for how to understand this early problem. And it'll become very important because you're trying to learn Augustine. And what's interesting is Augustine, we're reading Augustine's words. So here we are reading words from the teacher, but Augustine's telling us that we're the ones, uh, or the logos within us, is actually the one doing the teaching, not the words themselves. Okay? Thank you very much for watching. This is Medieval Philosophy. In our next video, we'll be going back to St. Augustine, and we'll be jumping into some more of his more classic metaphysics. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.